welcome to day three of GBS and Beyond together in person and online. We are just going to watch a quick sponsor video and then we'll get started with our first plenary session of the day. You're running your business day to day and you're seeing it like this, right? You're looking at all the challenges, the problems, the weaknesses, and then Stanford C teaches you to think like, like that. Getting to know about Stanford SIG program was a mirror. It's like going to business school, really. But I think it's even better. It came in at the right time to help think through some of the challenges, things like how to deal with corruption, things like how to motivate your staff. With the same resources, we're about five times more efficient than we were. We've just opened our 10th store. From six, we've grown to 10. We've more than doubled our revenues. We've grown 300%. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so that is another just kind of reminder that uh, we wanna thank our sponsors of GBS and beyond, um, not only Stanford Seed, but the Honkin School of e Economics, MIT Sloan, Cabell Scholarly Analytics, University of Leeds Business School, CapSim Simulations, ETS GRE, the Graduate Management Admissions Council, Monash University, Engagely, and then of course our co-hosts, Lewis Business School and the Rotterdam School of Management. So thank you so much. They're the reason why we can offer you all this fun experience. Um, so before I introduce the moderator for our next session, I am going to uh, just mention that our fourth teammate is here, Rob Vember. I know you guys probably all recognize him from our virtual events. He's usually our official MC, um, but he's arrived from the airport this morning because he was writing a law exam. So. After this session, I'll hand it over to him and he'll take us through the day. So I just wanted to mention, welcome, Rob. <laughs> okay. Okay, so next plenary session is uh, sustainable development and finance. And I am introducing our moderator, Dr. Mohammed Ali Nasir, who is an associate professor in economics from Leeds University Business School. Um, he's also a visiting research fellow at the Cambridge Center for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance. Dr. Nasir holds a PhD in economics and is greatly interested in the areas of monetary economics, macroeconomics, financial economics, and international economics, and energy and environmental economics. <laughs> so Dr. Nasir, please take it away with your panel. You're welcome. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you had mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole, for a very kind, uh, generous uh, introduction and very good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session on sustainable development and uh, sustainable and development finance. Uh, finance is a, a powerful resource and business schools are powerful institutions. Uh, indeed, uh, finance and the business school uh, can play a, 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 an impactful role in shaping the world and also tackling the climate change issues. But how it can be done is the question. For many years, for centuries, uh, the tool we applied and tools we developed were focused on maximizing profit, maximizing wealth. But in the 21st centuries, when we are facing existential challenges in the form of climate change, what role the business schools and what role the financial sector can play is the question. So as the question is a big one, luckily we have a, a very distinguished panel, uh, which includes uh, representation from industry and the financial sector, as well as uh, panelists from the academia. So on my immediate right is Moir Shad, from Technology Banking uh, City Commercial Bank, Netherlands. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And next to him is Elizabeth Naziri, Professor Elizabeth Naziri. She's also head of Africa Center for Development Finance in Stellen Posh uh, Business School. And uh, next to her is uh, uh, Sing Huang, from, uh, he's a professor in finance and also a shared dean at uh, Seoul Bridge International uh, Business School. 
So welcome uh, to all of you. And I would Thank start you. our discussion uh, with uh, a, a question which I would like all of you to respond to. And that is the role of business schools in collaboration with the industry or in any way, uh, which you think how they are doing in uh, tackling the issue of climate change and then uh, contributing to the development and sustainable finance. So maybe uh, to start with more, given that you're sitting immediately next to me. Yeah. Yeah, if I can start to you, please. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think to answer your question, there is a huge room for collaboration between business schools and uh, the industry. And I'm talking about banks in this case, but I think it applies to more than just uh, uh, banks. And that is to make sure that, in this case, banks uh, communicate regularly with business schools on what is the talent need uh, uh, that is required to be able to go through uh, the next period, which is very challenging. It is very, uh, is continuously changing. And people is always uh, the most important thing that any organization would have or count on in order to, to, to move forward and make a difference. And from a bank's point of view, as I mentioned, it is very important that business schools are teaching the right programs that would graduate talent that would be able to go and uh, uh, get jobs at banks and be able to make uh, the difference. And it's a two-way relationship, right? So banks should be able to communicate the, the, the talent need and business schools should be able to, to, to put in place programs that can uh, uh, cater around that. So I think this is a, a huge uh, room and it's a continuous one we can't uh, we, we have spoken with professor Singh before it's not something that you would agree on or put in place and think okay the job is done it could change on annual basis it could change on semester basis but there has to definitely be also a long-term strategy for that uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> agreed 100 percent good morning everybody um, what we now have noticed uh, at the business school at Stellenbosch business school is the need to continuously um, review our curriculum in consultation with the uh, industry. Um, we have a program called specifically development finance, and that's where the center is, uh, the one that I'm heading. And uh, with that, uh, under that program, our partnerships are uh, with your development finance institutions, your African Development Bank, the World Bank, Afro-Exim Bank, all these uh, development finance institutions, the local uh, institutions such as the Deve Development Bank, Southern Africa, DBSA, IDC. Uh, we do look at all the national development uh, financial institutions. We partner with them how they do give us students who work with them as, uh, our, as um, in our alumni office. But what's important is that need to continuously, continuously revise the curriculum and we have just revised our curriculum now and our creditors define it important. Further to that, um, other topics that our students are also looking at in terms of research. So we do have a social impact uh, component in our university where we uh, go out to the field, to the industry, to the communities, and we're asking what are the key issues, what are the key elements, and that is where the, the research would be focused for students. And then finally, uh, we talk about the SDGs. I think we talked about them yesterday, and we're talking about maybe SDG indicators uh, with my colleagues, um, David and them. Um, I think that is very critical with us, especially in the development finance program, all our students, all our students will undertake research that speaks to how finance can be used to achieve all of these uh, development, uh, uh, sustainable development goals. So development finance and sustainability at the Stellenbosch Business School is really the core, it's our playground and the collaboration are immense with both industry community and other academic institutions. Uh, thank you very much, that's very nice to know. Yes, Singh, uh, please. Okay, um, I have been teaching in the university for more than 30 years as a professor. Um, before 2000, the year 2000, I think if we open the financial management textbook, we say manager has only one goal, maximize shareholders' value. Uh, but guess what? In 2001, we have Enron uh, things happen. And at that day, everyone uh, blame finance professor. Why you teach our students just focus on maximizing shareholders' value? So we start to change. We say, okay, we want to maximize shareholders value under a condition 
of ethic and corporate social responsibility and corporate governance. So in the past 20 years, we have been talking about social responsibility and corporate governance. And then, but in recent years, people start to focus on environment. Uh, so in the past few years, we say we have only one world, we have only one earth, we are only one earth. And but today we see people say, now it's time to act. So I think we have built the awareness of everyone, including professors, students, manufacturers, consumers, about the awareness of the environment. So now we are saying it's time to act. But act what? Uh, that's, the, that's the question that I think uh, the school need to think of. What are we going to do um, for this environment? So that's why we say sustainability. Sustainability have three items, ESG, environment, social responsibility, and corporate governance. So in the past 20 years, we focus on social responsibility and corporate governance. Now it's time. Uh, we need to add environment into our curriculums. And then I think every school uh, will change their curriculum based on, based on their capacities. Some university they have environmental management engineering, some university have computer science. So some university will put business school, computer science and environment engineering and management together, try to take care of these newer sustainability problems. But some university may not have this kind of capacity, then they will do something else. I think that would be differences among the school. And then I think the strategy will depends on our university capacities. Uh, that's my observations. But the next question is, what are we going to do? <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe if, if you allow me, just, just to add one, one point, I think this collaboration is indeed have to be encompassing long-term strategic, but we need to think also outside the box, right? So banks, for example, or financial institutions together with universities can work on certain scholarships to make sure that uh, uh, the younger generation is uh, uh, having access to start with to a good education, but maybe incentivized to get education in, in certain things that we need, right? I mean, if, if we are able to identify where is the talent gap, where do we really need to focus our efforts in the future, then maybe we need to work on and thinking about how do we incentivize people to be part of, of that uh, strategic view that we all take together. Yes, yeah, Thank, thanks, Mo. But uh, you also see the things from the banking point of view. So uh, how do you see it? And I mean, uh, how do you see the role of the banking sector in that? And do you think there are certain things which could be done better? And absolutely, absolutely. Look, I, I think banks and many other institutions have have a, a large uh, area of improvement. But I think the key point here is that any step that we take forward has to be taken in collaboration with others, right? So the simple answer is, of course, banks can make more loans available to uh, uh, sustainable uh, projects or sustainable uh, needs, right? Uh, banks can uh, try to uh, uh, put in place scholarships to, 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 to attract people to, work, to go study such fields and then eventually uh, work in the bank. That's, that's a simple theoretical answer, right? But I think what, what needs to happen is that all uh, companies or participants in the ecosystem need to work together in order to make that achievable, right? So when banks are, uh, when banks say that they are willing to provide uh, more capital or more financing to sustainable projects, there has to be people who are willing to make such sustainable projects. There have to be enough uh, maybe uh, analytics companies that are able to say this project qualifies as a project that is sustainable, hence go give them that extra money uh, that you need. Governments need to be there, right? Because for a bank, at the end of the day, it's a for-profit organization, right? And I don't think that we should, when talking about sustainability, eliminate the for-profit element that many, many organizations are, are, are working for, right? This is, this is not a problem as long as it's done in a sustainable way. But the government rules and regulations need to also take into consideration tax incentives may be for projects that are going to do that, right? Uh, the capital that the bank raised to eventually lend to a sustainable project, which needs to probably come at a lower price, needs to also come in at a lower cost, right? And how do you make that? 
I mean, you, you can put tax incentives for investors. There's many ways that you can do. Uh, but what I'm what what I, to, to to again go back to your question, I think there is a lot that banks can do. And yes, on the surface of it, it is making more capital available to projects that need it that will take us in that direction. But this alone is 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 not enough. So as any other effort that we do in this sector, it has to be done in collaboration. Everything that we do, we need to think who are the stakeholders. Everybody needs to be on board. Great. Uh Elizabeth, given that I'm an economist, so I can't help myself <laughs> asking this question. Africa is a region which uh, a lot of uh, people say that where the future growth will come from. Okay, there's a lot of potential and the uh, the the future growth, and even we can see uh, most recently the certain countries in that region been growing uh, uh, at excellent rate. So I wonder if uh, you see why is there which could be uh, which Africa could learn from the other countries or certain things, certain mistakes which been made by the other regions in the world when they were developing at uh, a very higher uh, rate of growth. Uh, those things they could be avoided. Uh, how do you see it? Well, thank you. And uh, as an economist, yes, we talk about growth and we talk about uh, the high growing uh, economies that we have. In fact, some of them being small countries like, uh, you know, you have your Ethiopia, Rwanda and them. Um, but I think uh, in this era and as COP27 is underway now, we cannot fail to think about what Africa's problems are. Um, in terms of, uh, um, let's say, the climate issues, Africa's issues, uh, problems are traditional, I should say, and uh, perhaps contemporary in a way. Um, African countries have had, uh, let's say, landslides, floods, droughts. These we've, ha we've had as problems and challenges in some of our countries. Perhaps what has changed is maybe the frequency and severity. And these are things that are going to compromise even the growth potential, hence the sustainability that we're talking about. But I in the case of Africa learning from other countries uh, in terms of uh, growth and growth potential, I think our problem is one, that of our responsible leadership. We are going to talk about uh, anything else except for responsible leadership and responsible businesses. The reason why we're having uh, increased uh, severity and uh, frequencies of, let's say, the disasters that are happening to us and subsequently likely to compromise our growth potential is the fact that we are self show sure we've got the leaders that do not take into account the issues that he just, uh, my colleague just spoke about, your social, economic, environmental factors into the decision-making and investment uh, decisions. So you're thinking about returns, you know, uh, business profits and shareholder value, but what are you compromising? You're, deforest, you're deforestating, uh, perhaps uh, uh, cutting down trees that are supposed to be acting as windbreakers by the lakeside. So you are thinking about investment, uh, you're bringing in business, as you claim, FDI, for indirect investment, but at what expense at the vulnerability, increasing vulnerability of your people? So what do we want to look at? Maybe the lesson for Africa to learn out there is responsible business. So which countries out there are uh, leading uh, in terms of responsible businesses? So the ESG that you're talking about, it's not enough for us to just look at economic. So you're talking economic growth, and that's usually the challenge. We talk economic growth and the countries that are growing, they're higher, they're ranking highly. But when you talk about economic development and sustainability, those countries are now down. So where is the trade-off here? So as an economist, yes, we like to talk about economic growth, but I think we've gone beyond that and we should continuously look at these other factors. Where is the sustainability? Where is the development? So until Africa can think about conducting business in a manner that takes into account social as well as environmental factors on top of the economic uh, interest, the returns, I think that growth that we are seeing is not gonna be sustainable it will not be so responsible leadership for sustainability. Yeah, so same question, it can extend to you saying, how do you see it in Asian uh, experiment? Uh, uh, excellent uh, question. I uh, thought of this question long time ago. So I, I've done some study. <laughs> I've done some study for uh, 90, 100 countries in the whole world. Uh, and then um, if we said, it's because we are talking about ESG and these three, 
factors are different. If we talk about E, uh, environment, if we separate into Asia, Africa, Europe, America, then the results are not significant. It's not depend on the continent. Mm -hmm. it de it's depend on the country income level. So it's country income level. But if we talk about um, corporate social responsibility and corporate governance, is affected by institutional factors such as legal systems, investor protections, uh, financial freedom, uh, this kind of factors. So in that case, then we can separate into Asia, Africa, Europe, America. But if it is environment, we cannot. It's based on the uh, income level. So if we are talking about all oh, environment, environment, and then we say, okay, let's Every country, every country, we need to increase our environmental regulations. Then that's not a good strategy because some manufacturing company, they need to survive. So if they cannot survive in this country, they will move to another country. Okay. And then when they move to another country, and then those workers who used to work for this company, they will lose their jobs. And what kind of job they can get? Because they they tend to work for highly polluted industries. And we say AI can create jobs, right? But what kind of jobs? AI can create jobs for computer guys, not for those who used to work for highly polluted industries. Then we only focus on environment and we will not pay attention to the equality of income, gender, race, education, all of this. And that's not the right strategy. So we will say when we talk about sustainability, we need to think of ESG together. If we only focus on one thing, then we will have problems. So, so if you ask me about Asia, uh, I would say every country is doing their best. But we need to think of three things together. Otherwise, we will uh, make some mistake. Yeah, uh, ESG has been very uh, popular uh, topic or theme and for me uh, one way to gauge is that how many students this year would like to do their project on ESG and that has been increasing uh, quite exponentially and in fact this year it seems that like every student wants to their, do their project on ESG but if I can come back to you Mo how do you see ESG or other matrices like this do you say there are certain limitations weaknesses yeah. are we gonna uh, uh, ignore the wood for trees in, in this case, focusing yeah. on these limited matrices? I, I think the good news is that there are indeed many people with rising interest to go into that topic. But I think we are we still have a lot to do there as well, right? Because uh, I don't think that there is a clear standard and unifying definition or understanding of, of ESG. If, if you just maybe select a random sample in this room or at the bank or at the business school, there's going to be a, 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 a different views about what is ESG, what, what the concept is. And that's fine, uh, that's healthy, it's always good. But I think that it, it, that should be a, a, a more of a scientific topic where definitions are agreed, where the framework is, is, is clear uh, to everyone so that we can all basically make uh, progress when it comes to that. Uh, and I think it's very important because going back to the questions that you've asked me, a bank cannot do its role, for example, or any financial institutions that is providing capital to a project that is meant to be contributing positively to uh, any SDG or, or or that is sustainable. That's just for the sake of uh, of, of, of this discussion, meant sustainable, right? If they don't have the right metrics to uh, measure against, right? And I think that there are limitations in, in, in the sense that uh, they seem to still be one size fits all. Uh, I, I was chatting with some before the session. ESG metrics, the whole idea of giving an ESG rating should be very contextual, should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. It is essentially just like giving a credit rating, right? When S&P or Moody's want to give a credit rating to an organization, they would spend six months with them or more digging deep into what this company is doing, what markets is exposed to, and give a special rating for this company. And the same needs to go with, with ESG because... In my opinion, ESG is going to replace any metric that we talk about when it comes to uh, uh, the viability of any company or, or, or institution. So it, it, we need more people going into it. We need clearer uh, uh, 
standards and definitions. And yes, we need more uh, uh, work in terms of more metrics and more companies uh, uh, doing that. And this has to be, sorry, just one last point, it has to be recognized uh, by, by, by the ecosystem, right? Because again, if I compare credit ratings, S&P and Moody's happen to with Fitch become like a, a really an agreed thing. So when you say something is rated A, then people understand what that is. Uh, the same thing hopefully should happen when it comes to understanding or giving an ESG rating to a company, to a company or an institution. Yes, that is. I think uh, I would like to be a devil's advocate here. And uh, since we're talking about sustainability, uh, and I would like to draw attention to what is happening uh, in terms of uh, uh, financing models. Um, we're talking about perhaps uh, financial intermediation theory. Yeah, if I'm going, if I can take that route, we were, we were expecting households to save, yeah, and maybe other agents, they're saving into the banks and the banks are making this capital available to investors. But is that the model that's still happening now? I don't think that is where we are now because uh, we're seeing households that cannot save in any country, um, well, majority of countries except uh, Asian countries where the savings, household savings rate, rate to GDP is quite high. But in many of the developing countries, speaking about the African continent, that is not happening. Savers are not incentivized. So subsequently, we do not have capital. And so development finance in itself is also going to be, or the financing being sustainable is also going to uh, become challenging. So banks and other financial institutions are looking for other ways other than uh, the savings that's coming from the economic agents. Now, is that going to be sustainable? Is that what we want at the end of the day? I mean, that's why I said I'm the devil's advocate here. We need to start thinking about the models that financiers are adopting that are not necessarily looking at households, but are looking at other sources of financing capital or fund, investable funds. For Then ask the question, are those uh, sources of finance or funds, say your capital markets, are they sustainable, especially in Africa where you have fully developed financial sectors, fully developed financial systems. We do not talk of um, stock markets. They're not there. So where is the sustainability? I think we need to think about that as we um, face our students and we do not emphasize our traditional financing theories, financial intermediation theories, because I think they're under challenge right now. And I'd like to point that out when we are thinking about sustainable financing. Some of those questions have to come to the fore. Yeah, thank you. Great. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I want to e echo what Elizabeth said. Um, I think all the financial industry um, need to do different things in uh, Africa. Um, so, how to make people be able to invest, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the same time, we want to care about environment. Uh, okay, let me ask everyone questions. If we have A and B company, and this A company spend a lot of money on environment, social responsibility, and that's the cost, extra cost for the company. So the earning per share will become, let's say, $5 a year. And same industry, this company, they don't care about environment, they don't care about social responsibility, and their earning per share is 20. So A company earning per share is five, B company earning per share is 20. If you are an investor, which one you want to invest? A or B? Mm -hmm. A. A? Oh, you're a nice guy. <laughs> I think most of the people will choose B. That's the pressure for the CEO. I know, CEO, I'm, let's say I'm, I'm the CEO. I care about the environment. I care about the social responsibility. But if I am doing all of this, and I increase my cost, and I have worse performance than my competitors, my investor will discipline me or even fire me. So that's the problem. I think that's the major problem. Who is the, so who, who are the drivers of all of this? Investors mm -hmm. and consumers and consumers. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, it's not about, about the manufacturer. Manufacturer, they, they need to survive. So we need to educate everyone uh, about the environment, social responsibility, and corporate governance so that everyone will like you. 
then CEO will not have any pleasure and will do everything good for the environment, social responsibility, and corporate governance. Uh, if I can bypass go and come to Elizabeth, you mentioned about the behavior, and I know you did work on uh, the savings and investment behavior and shaping that. Uh, I mean, how, how, which way it, it, it could be done? Could you? Uh... Yeah, so the, so the, it's usually the trade-off between consumption and saving, uh, and I think that's where uh, not my, my passion is because I worry about savings because they're supposed to be. Yeah, investable funds in the end if S is equal to I. <laughs> That's why I had my earlier in, uh, you know, uh, interjection. Um, the challenge with say, well, sorry, with household uh, consumption uh, is um, is quite a huge one. Why? Uh, depending on from whose perspective we're seeing this. For the business schools and businesses at large, what do we want? We want to increase consumption. Yeah, the businesses want to see profits. And for them, they do not care whether uh, that consumption is facilitated by credit, credit cards, or by cash. They do not care. Now, if that is the, the motive, the, the purpose, um, we will have a case of uh, supply will provide demand. So we will have a lot of products out on the market. Uh, for those of us that were uh, on uh, in the DINA, I did share my experience of, uh, you know, targeted uh, marketing strategies by uh, the businesses out there. They do not care. They'll just put products out on the market and just, you know, supply will create demand. Uh, in the business environment, we talk about uh, let's start the business, let entrepreneurs come and then finance will follow them. Oh, the other way around, let's bring the finance available and then the entrepreneurs will come. So similarly, if the motive is to increase consumption, the private sectors, which are usually powerful in most of the economies, they're going to push that consumption. And we know that these are just the flip sides of, uh, of, of one coin. You increase consumption, surely you're compromising savings. So mm -hmm. the one is the private sector emphasis. The other is the public sector emphasis. So if the country is more concerned about domestic resource mobilization, after COVID, we all know that many of us that were relying on uh, um, ODA, for instance, overseas de uh, development assistance is not coming anymore. Uh, you now have to rely on your own domestic uh, resources. Now, to mobilize that, you're going to have to have policies that incentivize savers. And you can improve that. Uh, that's now private side, sorry, public side. Now, so we do find these um, um, maybe compromise governments being uh, driven by the private sector. So the more powerful they become, we're going to say to see more consumption. And if governments can stand up and they continuously have to look at external assistance, then we're going to end up with yes, no savings and private sector, as I said uh, earlier, on banking, uh, finances, and so on, looking for alternative ways of investable funds, we're going to increasingly see uh, compromised savings, compromised domestic resource mobilization. Right now, we're talking about remittances. Yes, there might be a good way to go, but with uh, the challenges that we're having on migration, so where are the remittances going to come from, the migrant remittances? So we do have a challenge if we don't look at it uh, seriously in terms of sustainability, because we cannot sustain debt. How in Africa we do talk about uh, government debt, public debt to GDP is too huge beyond 30%, 40, 60, 70%. Even the countries that you're talking about growing, that is not sustainable. What are we compromising? Domestic, domestic resource mobilization, poor savings, poor tax revenue collection, and uh, in the end, compromising some of the innovations, I think, as we shall see later. But uh, just to say something quickly to what, what he was talking about, and uh, my colleague over here, there is uh, increasingly been uh, uh, innovations in what we will call inclusive green financing. Yeah, so you're saying that uh, we want startups, we want more innovations into uh, what is sustainable businesses. So those startups, on the other hand, are also seen as high risk. Your banks and traditional uh, funders are not going to look at them. So something like inclusive uh, green financing can actually look at 
those uh, sectors or those little small businesses, SMMEs, that would appear to be risky to my colleague here, uh, who's, who's a banker. So we would have uh, um, products such as your credit guarantee risk schemes that come in. So I wanted to bring in that element of green financing right now as uh, a way of uh, curtailing uh, or at least helping those startups that might predominantly not get traditional uh, uh, funding from my colleague here yes, well, for development you. and sustainability. <laughs> from me, I, I have an open uh, shake. And I, <laughs> uh, do we have time? I just want yeah, to. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's. I, I think it's it's incredible discussion. I want to go back to company A versus company B. I would definitely pick the one with the lower EPS because the one with the higher EPS, I genuinely believe, is not going to be around maybe in 10 years or 15 years, right? And that is the thing that we really need to, 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 to understand. Awareness to me as an investor, right? Uh, that this is the case, that the, that the, that the sustainable uh, company is the way to go. So that's something important. And returns is a very interesting thing. So going back to the bank, the bank is raising capital and is paying money for it, right? And if it is going to give it to a sustainable project at a lower rate to incentivize it, something has to give, right? And that could be uh, uh, the government, again, having certain tax incentives to make sure that this capital is more readily available in an economic uh, uh, way, maybe. Uh, but but it's just really important that starting from us as individuals, as humans, we understand what choices are we going to make, whether where we put our money as savings, whether where we spend our money on every day. How did I come here this morning? Uh, what do I buy in the supermarket? And what company do I decide to invest my money in? What company do I decide to work for? This is all starting from us, right? And our government. People that we elect, people that we vote for, have the responsibility, right? Not only to speak at COP27, which they did in COP26 one year ago, and now they're like, ah, oh, nice to meet you again. Or what did we say last year? Last, last year? Oh, let's say it again, maybe with a little bit more amplified. The, these people need to drive the whole thing, right? Or otherwise they should not run for, for public office, I guess. I mean, uh, uh, I, I want to add <laughs> what Mo said. Uh, Mo said uh, investor care about ESG, right? But is there a very clear index for investor to see which company has a better ESG. No, that's, that's go that goes back to the metrics thing, right? I yeah. mean, we, we really need to work more on, on, on the metrics so that people are, uh, are aware, right? And on the long-term view, the government can basically tax people who are earning money in the first five years on the unsustainable company more than a company that has a higher ESG metric, which it says, if you buy stocks in a company that has an A rating on an ESG metric, your capital gain tax is less. You want to invest in the company that's making 20 times EPS, please go for it. That has a sustainability rating of C, your capital gain tax is going to be 60%, 100%. Um, that's how it works, right? I mean, the, yeah. somebody has to take the, 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 the leadership role here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, uh, talking of money, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, I'm mistaken, but I've been under the impression that there's a lot of money. I mean, under the there next is. generation uh, EU, and the European uh, Green Deal, uh, we are not part of EU after Brexit, but still I heard about it. There's, uh, I mean, yeah. a budget of about 1.8 trillion, there was allocation, uh, to one third of it, about uh, 0.6 trillion yeah. Yeah, is yeah, allocated yeah. for yeah. Uh, the Green Deal. Uh, do you see it as a, as a, a significant inject, uh, injection in, in, into the green development or green financing? Uh, I mean, Would that be ample? It, it, look, it's, it's not an easy question because I think uh, I read recently an estimate that we need 50 trillion to go to net zero by 20, uh, 2050, right? And it's mostly going to come after 2030. Why is that? Anything that we're going to do until 2030 is going to be based in technologies that we have. So more people using solar, more people using renewable, et cetera, et cetera. From 2030 going onwards, we need to develop, create, commercially test, expand new technologies. And that's that's a lot of money. So 0.6 or 50 is about 1.2%, right? Mm -hmm. If you tell me that we are getting the other 99% from somewhere else, then I'll say it's enough. If not, then somebody needs to pay more, right? Uh, and again, it's really where, where it's being spent. So 0.6 is not so much, doesn't seem to be so much, but that's not the only source where the 50 million is coming from. Uh, so if the government is willing to put 0.6 while putting into place a framework, the other 
49.4 are going to come from, then, then that's good. Yeah. But, but just trying to put things into context. So yeah. the, the question remains, who will pay for it and how? Correct, correct, correct. So, yeah. so when the government says, I'm going to put yeah. this much, uh, they should know who's going to pay the rest, right? In, in interest of the <laughs> or have an a, idea. A, a very last and a quick question I would like to uh, uh, ask all of you. And as the 2015, do you think 2015 is the, the right target or considering the, the, the outlook of the uh, global climate, climate change, uh, do you think the target should have being brought forward I, I think it's 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 mainly based on on scientific uh, search right that this is kind of that, that like the deadline this is where we need to be right so bringing it earlier i wouldn't even think about that because we're barely close to meeting it by 2050 right mm -hmm. so I, I don't think that we should put unrealistic uh, goals and if we say that 2050 is good uh, uh, to reach net zero which will have an impact on the climate change by 1.5 and that that would be good enough I, th I think we should just focus on that goal and work towards it, right? Because that is, unfortunately, by itself, still challenged. So, I mean, I don't think, I hope that we're going to get to net zero by 2050. I personally don't think, based on what's currently happening, we are going to get there. So if that's the good deadline scientifically, let's keep it and work towards it. Clearly, that's not a question for the developing countries. So <laughs> we are not party to this mission. So who is doing the dirty work? You're doing it. Uh, the developed countries are doing it, and we're paying the price. So guys, if you can do, if you can stop this as bring it forward, we'll be very happy because it's compromising a lot of uh, <laughs> other priorities that we have. I mean, you're talking about your electric cars and everything. Hey, we don't even have the energy. Yesterday, my colleague was here telling you 900 million uh, Africans or developed. Uh, country population don't have energy, uh, you know, basic energy to even warm myself. And <laughs> you're telling me about an electric car. The priorities are different here. Unfortunately, we're all in this and we're suffering. So you bring it closer, guys, we'll be happier because we're surely not to blame here. So that's probably not a question for me because I do have, we do have different problems in, 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 in the international, uh, sorry, the developing countries. We're looking at issues of financial literacy. We don't even know for God's sake, uh, how we can budget and borrow and the cost of our borrowings and all of that we, we we do have a lot of challenges nonetheless i think we will get there when we do uh we're taking footsteps uh, uh to get there south africa for instance yeah we do have uh, these uh, uh green bonds that we're using in various uh, instances water energy west uh, west um transportation buildings and all of that I think we will get there uh the countries that have uh uh this interconnectivity will help us get there when we should get there. Because even though I say, okay, we're not the ones to blame, we're clearly all suffering and we're in this together. 2050, is it too close? I think if the will is there, responsible leadership, I emphasize this because this is our slogan at the business school in Stellenbosch, responsible leadership and commitment will get us there so that we don't have to keep going for cops and talking the same words That's day okay. in, year in, year out. So it's commitment, purely that. I agree with uh, Elizabeth say. Um, now we are saying 2050, 2060 goal. Huh? And then uh, that kind of goal is based on production CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So we, we focus on producers. But we need to focus on another things. Consumers, if we look at consumption-based CO2 emission, then we will see when a country import more product, they will contribute more on CO2 emissions. So what kind of country import more, consume more? What kind of country? Definitely not Africa. No, right, right, right. No. It's, it's here. I so, right. so, so we need to um, focus on, now we need to focus <laughs> on consumption-based CO2 emissions. Then I think we will change uh, our direction a little bit. Uh, that's what I want to say. Uh, because it is allow me, and allow me to say something as we close in there. Apologies, I know the time's up. But yesterday there was this discussion on the stakeholder uh, uh, initiatives. Yeah, stakeholder, multi-stakeholder management or initiatives. 
And what we're talking about here is a classic scenario of interest versus influence. Yeah, who's got the interest, the highest interest to even have this net zero emission and what is the influence? The influence is so high and those that are very powerful will continue to push to even 2060. We will next, uh, we'll find ourselves in 2100 if there's such a, a year. But do you have enough interest to actually see us going to net zero vis-a-vis -vis the influence, the power that you have? So I always go back to that greed of power versus interest. The very individuals, the very institutions, the very stock stakeholders that are very influential and powerful are not interested in seeing that. So we would like and desire to have it at 2050 and see to it. But is the commitment there by the very influential and powerful stakeholders to actually realize it within the prescribed time? I raised. Can my I case. can I take 30 <laughs> seconds? And I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. No, no, no. It's it's actually it's actually I have good news. It's maybe I say it in an ironic way, but I do have good news. Okay. Uh, people, including myself and many people that are living in Amsterdam, are conscious about taking showers in the morning because of the energy bill, right? And I say, why do I say this good news? Because we deserve it, because it is years and years of unresponsive behavior that basically led people to think before they take a shower in Amsterdam uh, because of the energy uh, bill. So it's not you alone. It, it's, <laughs> it's now, it's, it's impacting everyone and it should so that everybody can basically uh, be interested to influence it in the right way. Oh, okay, great. Encouraging. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think uh, at this point, maybe we can take a, uh, do we have a time for a couple of uh, questions? We, we, we don't. We, we don't, I'm afraid. We, we're going to have to end it on the notes and wonder who's taken a okay, shower this well, morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end, then, I would like to thank all our panelists for their time and contribution. So could you please put your hand together? <laughs> thank you. Thank you.